Hey guys, CJ with George Astronomy. Welcome back to the channel. So I uh, finally got the GEM45 testing done last night uh, on July 3rd. It was uh, beautiful weather. Perfect for uh, getting the telescope out and getting some things set up and running some tests. But more importantly, was actually getting some data. So I uh, did several tests unguided. Of course, one of the first things I always want to do is, of course, get set up, get polar aligned, which I did do successfully. The uh, reset the iPolar on the GM45. It did work flawlessly, and I double checked it with the Sharp Star program just to make sure. And, uh, and it was, it was very, very well dialed in. So uh, polar alignment, as you saw there, uh, was under an arc minute. So was definitely doing well there. Uh, zero backlash, so I had excellent uh, uh, the balance on the mount and everything looked pretty good. So uh, being I had to record this the day afterwards because my recording didn't work last night except for the screen capture, I may jump around a little bit, but let's jump ahead. And once again, with the magic of video, we've jumped ahead again. So uh, one of the cool things you could do uh, in Nina when uh, you're doing roll setups like this is uh, if you're in guiding and you go ahead and you turn on your sync button and then you do a plate and solve or, or plate solving, uh, it will not only plate solve the image that you're taking through the main camera, but then it also will sync the telescope uh, to the location so that later on down the line uh, when you go to make movements afterwards uh, the telescope will know where it's at so it, typically when I start off uh, of course I, after I'm polar aligned I'll actually do a uh, plate solving on Polaris and then when I go to do the guiding assist on PhD2 I will slew over to the eastern horizon probably more southeast-ish uh, than true east, kind of southeast and probably about 25 degrees or so uh, above the horizon in order to run guiding assistant. It seems like that particular area is usually going to be telltale for me as far as like what's, if I'm going to foresee any kind of issues, especially with balance, just because of the way that it's sitting. Uh, my balance will always seem to improve when I'm going up over the, uh, up to the meridian and then off to the other side, but it's usually in those lower uh, altitudes that if I've got a balance problem, it's going to show up there. And I would prefer that it show up there when I'm doing guiding assistance so I can get an idea of where I'm at. And uh, huh, there's another big explosion right next to the house. Yay. So uh, once I got lined up, got my guiding assistant running, uh, I leave guiding operating. That's just like I showed you, went ahead and did another parade solve. And then, of course, I'm running the autofocus routine. And that is just to... Uh, uh, even though it was already set from before, you want to get that razor sharp focus. So part of what I was doing was to just go ahead and uh, dial it in one more extra time here on the autofocus routine. Now, the parameters that I set on this to try to, I didn't want to skew this testing um, to, in, you know, for perfect world scenarios. I wanted to kind of, I wanted to run it exactly the way I would do it if I were just setting up and going. And so typically when I do the setup, when I get done with uh, my polar alignment, when I get done running the guiding assistant, I do not do star alignments. Um, I honestly don't see any reason for it, especially if you're using plate solving. So I don't bother doing like a one or two or three star alignment. Uh, I plate solve, I go over to the Southeast, I go ahead and set up guiding assistant, I do another plate solve. I will then plate solve and sync the scope like you just saw me do here a second ago. And then I'll go ahead and run the autofocus uh, just to make sure that I'm dialed in perfectly. And uh, at that, once I figure out where I'm at, I will then start running uh, the test. So as you can see, the right now the guiding is turned off again because it's going through the uh, autofocus routine. Um, and once it gets finished, it will kick itself back off again. But we will go back in and we will turn off auto guiding and then we will start the test. Vanishes of living in the country out here. Uh, anyway, so I turned off the guiding at this point, and uh, if you'll notice here on the imaging, I set it for an elapsed time of 60 seconds exposures. Uh, this is just done on the luminous frame one by one, 
And uh, again, the, the guiding is off at this point and the actual uh, mount is on its own tracking. So you'll see there it says tracking enabled and that is the mount that is actually now uh, doing its own uh, little thingy there making sure it's on track. So again, the guiding is off at this point and uh, you'll even notice there on the graph that's no longer moving on the bottom. So here's the 60 second test. Now, one of the things we're gonna be looking for here is uh, to see if there's any distortion in the in the stars. Obviously if there's any you know oblong to it or any streaking and that's what we're looking for. So this is in real time with the 60 second exposure at uh, bending one by one with the ASI 183mm on the Radian Raptor 61 with the Gem 45. Drum roll, please. Bam. Okay, so blowing it up, let's look at our first, let's look at the big star because that's going to be the one we're going to look at. There we go. And if uh, we blow it up, you look at there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little too big. Back it out just a little bit. Uh, no streaking. A nice good round star and that's at 60 seconds so let's go up to 90 seconds and see what happens and just to show once again we are not tracking they are not actively tracking at this point this is all on the mount itself so 45 seconds into it You know, it's probably important. <laughs> now, I, I will uh, I will further this by stating that uh, I did not run this out as far as I possibly could. Um, th by this point, it's close to eleven o'clock at night, and I wanted to get data run on the iris, so I wound up only wound up going up to two hundred forty seconds total time. But I thought that that was more than enough to to show that even with lucky imaging uh, with this mount, that it tracks so well uh, that you don't have to worry about guiding uh, at that point if you're just doing some lucky imaging. So here we go, 90 seconds. And once again, we're gonna blow up the big star and there we go, no streaking, nice and round. Everything looks pretty good. So let's bump it up again, right? Let's bump it up again and I'm just gonna speed up the video here because uh, uh, you're going to see it. The, the mount operates absolutely beautifully. And here, once again, we're up to the 122nd mark. About to roll over. Bang. And there we go. And just to prove, not that I got to sit here and prove I'm doing this, it's retarded, but you can see her on the side. I'm starting to get the amp glow uh, from the camera itself because I'm going longer and longer exposures and uh, I'm actually not actively cooling at this point. So if you look up there in the upper left hand side, I'm not even on cooling power at this point. It's just running as it's running. So 120 seconds, you're starting to see the amp glow. Again, we're going to pop it up to 40, which will be the last run, and let's speed that one up. And again, just to show you, by looking at the Ioptron Commander, you can see that it's actually in motion. So the 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 mount is moving uh, in in speed with uh, with the tracking enabled on the G well you see under, underneath GPS okay there says tracking enabled so the mount is moving and this was taking it up to 240 seconds and again we are unguided you can see the uh, guide graph underneath there is not active it's not actively pinging so this is all just the mount this is just the mount itself with those awesome locks on there no knobs uh, not stupid high weight. I, you know, I guess if you really wanted a, a better understanding of it, uh, it's capacity, maybe go up higher on the capacity and I'm probably only pushing maybe 20 pounds worth of gear on there right now. So yeah, you know, might, might do a little bit worse, heavier, but you know what, if you're balanced, 
it's not going to make any difference. If you're balanced, it's going to operate just fine. There's not going to be any issues whatsoever. Uh, you know, even even though I'm looping in PhD, you can see that there's no movement. There's no jumping around, uh, even looking through the guide camera at this point. It's just nice and steady. So, yeah, you know, overall, I got to say the GM45, I'm pretty impressed. Uh, again, I didn't go past 240 seconds. I really didn't feel like there was a need to. Um, but I do feel confident I probably could have gone a full, you know, 300 seconds, maybe more. I'm not really sure. I, I haven't really pushed it uh, as far as I could possibly go. But uh, certainly can prove that, you know, if you're just wanting to do some lucky imaging, uh, you know, or, or doing, uh, you know, using something like uh, a video you know, camera, if you're doing like planetary or uh, uh, yeah, planetary or something like that, uh, you wouldn't need a guider. Uh, it actually seems like it does pretty good. Now for longer focal lengths, don't know, couldn't answer that again, would have to have a different scope up there in order to test it with that. But as far as uh, wide field and as far as, uh, for 61 millimeters and, uh, what about 20 pounds setup? Yeah, there you go. Can't, uh, can't argue with those right there. It's a pretty good mount. And just a quick follow-up, because somebody asked me about this uh, not too long ago. If you're going back to something you were working on previous, if you go into framing and change it over to file, and then load your image from a previous run, so I'm actually pulling up uh, from uh, some data set that I, I ran several weeks back, you can actually pull up uh, one of those if you ran it and it didn't, had it fits named in your, in your naming convention. You can actually pull that in uh, and plate solve it and actually use that, uh, to go back in order to go back onto the image. So you don't have to try to, you know, line it back up again. You can just use one of your previous data runs, uh, which is what I've done here. I just went ahead and grabbed one from uh, several weeks back and uh, used that one in order to plate solve since I was going back on that target anyway, and then just, uh, set it up. So once you click over to start guiding and slew to target, and it's plate solved and you're set up, then all you got to do is just hit go and you are off into the races. Isn't that pretty sweet? Yeah, so after all that was said and done, uh, I got on my object and got it started about 11.15 or so last night. And uh, there was the first image come across for the iris. So I got more to do tonight on that and uh, got to get uh, some more luminous data on it and then go ahead and shoot some RGB. Uh, so that's pretty much it. That's it for the testing. If you have any other questions about it, feel free to drop a comment below and ask away. Also, too, some Roswell astronomy videos will be uploaded here very soon, probably this evening, might even be before or after this video posts. And with that, thanks for watching.